So El Salvador is always winning. They're winning back their diaspora. Paso a paso, one at a time right now. But it'll be a flood. Like, that's how these things happen. That's why you're going to see. Like, El Salvador is naturally going to become the the Florence 2.0. But also Singapore 2.0 and Hong Kong 2.0. And we are live here from Bitcoin Beach with the one and only Volcano Blonde, uh, <laughs> Stacey Herbert, uh, gracing us today. Actually, uh, Max is uh, in the background. We were talking about his, uh, his Speedo uh, shot later. <laughs> so if anybody spotted that on Twitter yet, he was out roaming the beaches in his uh, Bitcoin Speedo. So I, I want to see that. Uh, but... <laughs> It's maybe like a, maybe a I don't. Attraction, a tourist attraction yeah. here. You know, Max should be paid for that. Uh, well, you know, he's he's got the legs for it, so uh, <laughs> we'll we'll have to see. Usually, uh, if you're saying somebody wore a speedo, you're hoping like more than just the legs for that. Like <laughs> it's so uh, you think of something else. Well, well, well I won't get into that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's great to finally have you on. You have played such a role in what is uh, happening here in El Salvador. And even though you've been here for a short time, I feel like you've been more places and know more people than I do, uh, even after decades. And so it's been uh, it's kind of been fun watching you guys champion El Salvador and help push this thing forward on a lot of different levels. Um, so yeah, welcome. Well, El Salvador uh, feels to me, like my destiny, like this is all, all my life was preparing for this and everything, all, all my successes, all my failures, all my mistakes, all my great job, like everything led to exactly where I need to be. Um, and it's, it's interesting because when you introduced me as the volcano blonde, you know, that was a nickname given to me by Bitcoin Twitter. Uh, very early on. I think it was actually Sam Samo call, started calling me Volcano Blonde. And since then, I also have Fairy Godmother and now uh, Keeper of the Vision. And, you know, I went um, many years without any nicknames until I came to El Salvador. And now I have three. And it makes sense because it's um, I've become who I was meant to be. Like this was everything I've I've done till now was meant for here. So now I'm, 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 I'm very clear with myself and in myself and other people can see it, I think. That's why I think I have these nicknames suddenly. And I think you added a another title recently. I don't, <laughs> I don't know exactly what the official title is, but I know you've been helping the country basically here with all things Bitcoin related with the Bitcoin office. So how, how did that come about or what you can actually tell us about you know, I'm, I'm sure some of it is a state secret, but you, you know, the things you can divulge and um, what you guys are working on now and what you're excited about. Uh, the Bitcoin office was started out of Max Geyser came up with the idea. He was not wearing his Speedo at the time when he came up with the idea. <laughs> we were sitting in uh, San Salvador at Il Bon Gustaya restaurant having some nice Salvadoran coffee. Was, was that the place he wasn't allowed into the first time because he had <laughs> no. uh, shorts, shorts on? Shorts on, that was brutal. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, but we were sitting there and, um, you know, just in terms of, we were already doing a lot of work. I was, you know, Max and I do d different things behind the scenes, but I was doing a lot of work already in terms of, uh, you know, helping with, with Bitcoin policy. And um, and Max just came up with the idea. Well, why don't you just in, instead of you're, you're duplicating a lot of your work you're having to do, you know, work helping out the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Economy or Ministry of Education about the same people or the same projects over and over again. So why don't you just create an office called the Bitcoin office, as that's the point of of um, you know introduction to 
the government of El Salvador in terms of Bitcoin, because obviously entrepreneurs and uh, Bitcoin tourists, they don't need a Bitcoin office. But in terms of interaction or executing President Bukele's policy, um, you know, to, to be more streamlined through a person who has been around in Bitcoin for a long time, uh, since very, very early days and knows not only Bitcoin, but importantly, like all the players who who is who. Who's it, who's real? Who's a scammer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot to do with that. Um, you know, we know everybody. So it's um, a, a, and so it, it, it made many things easier for the president and for everybody in the government, um, everybody that. I've talked to you now in the government is very happy that there's a Bitcoin office because it gives them a place to send, you know, Bitcoiners or shitcoiners, like the people that call who say they're Bitcoin. And I'm like, who is that person? I've never heard of them there. They, you look at their website and it's like, where's the Bitcoin logo? Like, where is any, any suggestion or indication that they do anything with Bitcoin? Yeah, they usually have they have something better than Bitcoin, the new Bitcoin that uh, yep. is better for El Salvador. Yep. Uh, yeah, those people are streaming through nonstop through Hope House. And yes. I, it's actually kind of stopped now. I think they've gotten the hint that yes. they're not welcome. So yes, it's, yes. it's great to see that yes. you were playing that role helping the government because I know even a lot of people in the government, this was a new thing for them. They weren't, you know, long time Bitcoiners. And yeah. so it'd be easy to get kind of tricked into something because these people can be very smooth. Well, you see that all the time. Um, you see it all the time with famous people. So Joe Rogan goes on Twitter or he's on his podcast and he asks like, what is this Bitcoin thing? And you see immediately, like first he gets Andreas Antonopoulos and he's a, Andreas is an amazing orator, right? And, and can and an educator as yeah. well. He's so good at explaining Bitcoin. Then um, he gets bombarded with you know people with a lot huge followings on twitter who have millions of followers who say you know and they're cryptographers or they're like heads of a shit coin and they seem legit and they use fancy words that make somebody's totally new to it and you know that this isn't their life they're not like a bitcoiner hanging out on the beach and 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 talking bitcoin all day and swapping sats right yeah. there is it's a guy who has limited time to like try to comprehend something and he's bombarded by these seemingly intellectuals who are saying like the the case against bitcoin and why that's dinosaur technology and why they need to adopt the shitcoin so you see it all the time like it and and that's why like when max and i first heard president bukele announced like the it, that he was going to make Bitcoin legal tender in June of 2021. Like we had already seen this so many times and we just like remained very uh, skeptical. Don't trust verify for a long time. We just watched and watched and just assumed that there was going to be like a Miami coin sort of situation or a Sango coin, how a uh, car did that. So that's what the assumption was that the, this, this is what like, uh, don't get our hopes up. Uh, this is what inevitably happens, right? That, because these people, who announce something like this, they get bombarded. And and those people did show up. I mean, you, yeah. the, what's his name from Cardano was here and there was all these different people here pitching their things. So I, mm -hmm. I, I was concerned too of like, okay, are they gonna stay the course or are they gonna get off track here? Well, no, President Bukele is like, he's so smart, right? He's, he's, he's like next level. Um, he's smarter than I am. And um, he's smarter than most people I know. And he's orange pilled. Like yeah. he's, a, he's a Bitcoiner. Um, but the, the thing is like, you know, you know how governments are. They're huge bureaucracies, right? So all it takes is one person in some random low like bureaucrat to, you know, meet with one of the shit coiners and the shit coiner runs around and says, I have a government deal. Yeah. Like, yeah. Then they're posting that picture all over Twitter about like as an endorsement. Of, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, so, yeah, the Bitcoin office. Like helps orange pill. Well, you know, it helps give, um, you know, just. A clear message like there's one message coming out of here. We're Bitcoiners. This is Bitcoin country and we want Bitcoiners to come here, builders to come here and build 
a Singapore 2.0, a Hong Kong 2.0, and a Florence 2.0. Well, we're, we're thinking huge, not yeah. just just Singapore, not just Hong Kong, not just Florence. Like we want it all and more. And have you seen that on on your end, on companies that are contacting you? And uh, I mean, I I see a lot of that, but I'm sure you see see a lot more as far as companies with a long term vision. Maybe they don't have something huge set up so far but they're getting ready to launch something much bigger oh here. definitely i can sense like a complete difference between today and one year ago exactly when we came in terms of the quality of the the companies and people and individuals coming here but it's a lot to do with the work that president bukele has done you know behind the scenes i mean i, I think you know most people on Twitter and stuff like we're like big braggarts, like we like to like say all the stuff we're doing and not actually do anything. But uh, he's been like laying a very, very, very solid foundation and very low time preference. Like I am way more anxious and always like, do this, do that. Like, let's go. <laughs> like, let's get the securities law now. And, um, you know, but it's perfect timing. Like he was right. It's the perfect time to uh, introduce it. No, I, I agree. I'm the same way. I was like, oh, if they don't do it now, maybe they'll lose the faith and they'll get off track. But they're kind of just, nope, we got a plan. Everything's in its time. We paso know, a paso. We know where we're going, so it doesn't matter if it happens this month or next month. Yeah. Like, But it's not that it's not happening. There's steady progress, but they have an order to it. Oh, my God. Like even uh, when we did the Bitcoin office, like top 21 Bitcoin moments of 2022, just looking at the catalog of achievements just from one year of 2022, it's extraordinary what, you know, the country has achieved from President Bukele down to Bitcoin Beach. Like we've there's just been a, a, a real solid foundation from, you know, from all the education projects. Now, that's one of the first things we noticed, Max and I, when we came here and, um, you know, we were like, how do we help? And we were looking at uh, opportunities to invest and bring investors here. And, you know, many of the companies all asked, like, are there any Bitcoin engineers there <laughs> or programmers? And um, I was like, well, um, I guess that we should fix that. Let's uh, let's called Jimmy Song and because uh, Jimmy Song was here that in January yeah. of last year. So I, I asked him if he would do, uh, you know, he's the top educator of uh, pro programming Bitcoin. He wrote the book Programming Bitcoin. He's, um, you know, taught the guys at Square, Cash App, Block, whatever they call <laughs> they're called now, um, you know, Jack Dorsey's company. Fidelity, he taught them like he he's he he does a lot of um you know training of the Bitcoin programmers. So Jimmy's an old friend and um he said, Yeah. So we trained the Bitcoin seven, the Jimmy Song seven, who are the seven Salvadoran Bitcoin programmers that Which which is huge because there were none before. Exactly. And you in order for the future generations to rise up, they have to have a mentor or somebody who's done it before them. So yes. having that first seven is it's more important than having 700 somewhere else. Exactly. So these are like, these things have to be done, right? They just, it, it takes time. They have to be done in order for you to get to the next step. Like everything is paso a paso. You have to keep on doing these things and like, there's no shortcut to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we just have to keep on working. We have uh, the projects that you and Chimbetta and the rest of Bitcoin Beach team are working on with the Department of Education and other education projects here in Hope House, uh, Me Premier Bitcoin, you know, the, the, those are all like great foundation for, uh, you know, high school level students, junior high school level students. And then we're, you know, we are working on some more uh, education projects, bigger ones for that elite programming and coder sort of guy. So I, I can't go too much into it because we're still working on it and, and formulating it and, you know, creating the program. But, um, you know, there, there's uh, some good stuff, more good stuff coming. So where, where a year ago, there really was nothing. Now there's this pipeline that yeah. is going to start growing exponentially. And, and I think some of the best coders in the Bitcoin space are going to come out of El Salvador in, you know, yes. the following decade. Yes. Decade. 
Well, I want it in four years. You want it years. in four years? <laughs> well, maybe maybe it happens sooner. I, I like to be you know, cautious in my estimates. And these things, you know, they take a little bit of time yeah, to, yeah. to see fruition. But yeah. um, we will definitely see steps before that. But I could see 10 years from now, this being the center of the Bitcoin world that if you're a Bitcoin company, you have to have your headquarters in El Salvador. Yes, yes. And especially now that we did pass the securities law, which creates the template and the foundation and the framework upon which uh, uh, these new capital markets can be built upon Bitcoin. So we have s such a first mover advantage in El Salvador. It's crazy. And it's so good that President Bukele has remained so focused and low time preference building Paso a Paso. He just like has he gets the next step done that needs to be or so even for example the um you know the the situation with the gangs where look you bring your you know his plan one of the first things that really drew me to staying here was that phrase he used of like where el salvador is going is to the place we want to be which like blew my mind right like it's so powerful it's exactly you know, the Renaissance 2.0 thinking. And it is the vision of a leader. And there aren't very many leaders. Like you can go through the last thousand years of history and maybe there are like 30 or 40, right? He's like one of them. And so when now we have that opportunity, right? Like this is, this, this is, uh, this is what we're going to build with his new securities laws. Like he has provided that, but like when, when we're, it, when we're going to that place, we want to be of huge success. And when he also said like, never let anybody tell us we're too small to be big. Yeah. Like when we get really big like that, the structure of the economy and the society here in El Salvador for decades had been exactly what Bastia had said about when it when a group of men in society, um, you know, uh, plunder when they begin to plunder, they create for themselves a a moral uh, legal system and a moral code to justify it. So you had a system whereby the the elites were stealing all the tax revenue, all the, you know, any infrastructure spend. Blatantly. They would, Blatantly. Just, they would just steal hundreds of millions of yeah. dollars from this tiny economy. Then you had the gangs, which were outside of any government control. Like, the, that's like, you know, medieval age sort of the old term for outlaw. Like, when you were outside of the law, outlaws were outside the law, right? They were in a zone that was not within the law, which is not you were not protected by the law. So these were outlaw areas. They were not protected by any government or, or law. And pretty much the whole country fell under that that type of system. I yeah. mean, gov businesses from small to even giant corporations paid protection money. It was just part of normal life. Yes. And that went, so when he, you know, so he has a policy of economic liberty and he's, he could see that he's achieving this great rebrand, what we call the greatest rebrand in history. Capital is coming, investors are coming, entrepreneurs are coming, people from around the world are moving here. And yet the people of Soyapongo, Ilopongo, Apopa, they're never going to be able to participate with the structure of what we had here yeah. up until March. Those 28th. people aren't going to come to those areas unless those areas change. Well, prosperity wasn't even an option for them because it was always going to be stolen. Yeah. So the gangs would always steal it. So how do you extend the rule of law, enlightenment, 
the right, the human rights of life, liberty, and property. You know, the, these are the ideas of Bastia, the, you know, well, before him, like the, the Enlightenment thinkers of what, what we founded in America and what happened with the French Revolution and the ideas is that we all have the human right by, by our maker, right? Like we're endowed with this. This isn't something that a government gives to you, but they, the government is there to uh, protect. protect those rights. You have the right to life, liberty, and property. And obviously, people in Swayapongo, Ilipongo, and Apopa, those three that I've been to, you know, they did not have any government there. That's why they were outside the law. The law was not protecting them because they did not have the right to um, enjoy life, liberty, and property. It was obviously taken from them, life, you know, we saw that with a high homicide rate. Yeah. Uh, they were shaken down, at least 20, 30% of all their income was taken from them. They um, did not have liberty because they, from what I understand, because I've only been there since the president cleared out the gangs, that when I first drove into Soyapongo, uh, the Salvadorans I was with said to me um, that you would have had to go through checkpoints, essentially. Your car would have been stopped and you would have had to give money to get in and then to get out. Um, now, I went into those places with uh, some money from Bitfinex to hand to, you know, some Bitcoin on my hot wallet. And I announced <laughs> it to the world, right, that I'm coming in with a hot wallet with $200,000 on it to give away to people. And like hundreds of people just showed up and they were like, it was just me, no security, just surrounded by hundreds of people, uh, completely, you know, the sense- In a popa. A popa was the final one that of the three. Okay. And I have to say, um, I went with the translator and um, this Salvadoran camera guy, and they both, they didn't want to go. <laughs> they, they were scared because they said it was too dangerous. And uh, why is this crazy gringa going there? I'm not going with her. I'm going to get killed. And then I was like, well, I'm going. It's just like, you know. Imagine that sort of sense, right, of of being like your own Salvadoran citizens, like part of the population being afraid to go see you. Even the the police. I remember one time we attended a church in San Salvador and it's not even in that bad of an, an area, but there is a, a small community next door that the gangs controlled and somebody stole the tire off somebody's car during the church service and they called the police out. And they're like, well, aren't you going to go over there? They're like, no, we're not going over there. That The gangs control that area. And that was the police saying that. That's how out of control it was. But just think of, you know, this is one thing that the the FUD and the hate in the mainstream media, what they, you know, they, they just focus on things that they control because they're the cantillionaires. They're the fiat masters. They get to print the money and they get to create the numbers to look at. But what about that psychology? What about that transformation of the inner being of the Salvadoran people? To be from a popa and know that people are afraid of you, like what sort of psychological impact does that have on the individual that, you know, if you're just an ordinary person, you're not a gang member and people are afraid of you, they're afraid of your home, they're afraid of your neighborhood, like it's a negative vibe, right? It's, you can't get a taxi to come pick you up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were in Soyapongo and um, who was it? Like, I think the one of the waiters at um, the hotel we were staying at at that time, uh, the Nico Urban, he's from Soyapongo and he, well, he does say that like he used to, every time he took the bus home at night after work, he would have to give money to the gangs. And, he doesn't have to give money to the gangs. It was like $2, um, but it's a lot of his income, right? He's probably only making $12 yeah, a day. So yeah. to have to give two of it away yeah. is a huge tax on him. But he was saying like, you know, it, Soya Pongo, you know, it used to be like, that was the, the embarrassing place to be from. Like it, you didn't want to tell people you were from Soya Pongo. Um, again, like just think of that psychology and, and what it it does to a people. And I think like, actually, I, I, it made me suddenly think of um, Maradona. <laughs> you know, it may, 
President Bukele is like the Maradona of, of this situation because Maradona, you know, when he went into Naples, did you see that the documentary about him? No, I haven't seen oh, it yet. Oh, wow. I can't believe because it's, it's so right up your like how the work you do um, in terms of the transformative nature of, of just him. It wasn't like um, it just because of his excellence and on the field, like how he changed people's perception. So when he went to Naples, Naples was like hated by all Italians. They were poor. They were scumbags. They were uh, impoverished people. And it was an embarrassing place to be from. And, um, you know, they were mocked like it was the film does a great job of showing you actually that it was genuinely they were just like the the just the total scum of the yeah. earth uh and suddenly maradona goes to play there and like when he arrives like the just the sheer size of the crowds just um on the streets like cheering for him and his face is just like shocked because you could see like the like the demand on him to g give them some sort of redemption and um bring something to them which he did, he transformed the whole city, uh, the, the psychology of the city. And it's amazing to see, but that's also what President Bukele has done here because, you know, he didn't forget about those p areas that were controlled yeah. by gangs. And I think it's, um, I think he should be applauded instead of the US mainstream media, how they are mostly so negative. Obviously, Fo you know, Fox or Tucker Carlson is, is a great fan of what he's done. And I think it's, if you go there, if you've been there and I've been there, I've been there since they've been liberated. Um, and you can't help, but see, that's why when, um, you know, there have been some people in the Bitcoin community who, who were against it. And I invited them to come here and go there with me and see for themselves, because this is a don't trust verify yeah. situation. Don't trust, what you read, just don't take their word for it just because some, you know, posh, you know, journalist at Bloomberg or Washington Post wrote this and some from their Oft seat. Often not even having visited El Salvador. Yeah, yeah. Well, even like one of these Bloomberg guys who, you know, wrote some negative stuff about me and Max and Bitcoin and President Bukele, um, he you know, I was trying to help him out and he went to uh, a popa and um, he didn't go to the mural we painted there because he said he, he was told it's too dangerous. I'm like, well, I went there. So with, with by the way, 250,000 I had on, on my hot wallet there. Like nobody knows you, Joe Bag yeah. don't. And like if, if they were going to do something, if, it, if there was danger there, you know, basically, you told him to sack up and. Uh... <laughs> no, well, he just wrote his hit piece. Yeah. Right. So but luckily, you know, it's very easy to get to El Salvador. They've now extended the tourist visa, you could say, for six months. Um, it's a short flight from Miami, direct flights from New York, Washington, D.C., Houston, Los Angeles. Um, so many Europeans are coming here for the first time. Uh, yeah, direct flights from Madrid. Yes, yes, yes. So it's easy to verify for yourself. I mean, you don't have to trust me or Mike or Max or anybody else. You just come verify for yourself. And everybody I know has the same experience. I, I haven't had, I haven't met none of my friends. Nobody who has come here has gone, oh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't that interesting. It's like, it's life changing, like for a lot of people. Well, and and I think if I remember right, hearing from you, even when when the first conference was announced here, you were like, "Oh, I'm not going to El Salvador. That's <laughs> it's a dangerous place." And that yes. was that was even for you that. But just coming and visiting, how how did that transformation happen to you? Was it right when you hit the ground and you just saw how amazing the people were, or what what made you change your mind about the potential here <laughs> and the lack of danger? So, well. We were invited by Rodolfo of LeBitConf uh -huh. to come here. And I, you know, 
we've known him because he's been an early Bitcoiner because of Kaiser Report. So he, you know, he was in Argentina and Argentina found Kaiser Report very early. We were talking about Bitcoin in 2011. And of course, they were going through uh, hyperinflation and, and currency crises. So they naturally um, came to Bitcoin. Kaiser report and and immediately Argentinians were early adopters of Bitcoin, right? So we already knew him and he invited us. And I was like, yeah, okay. Um, and then like a few days later, he was like, okay, great. Thanks. Cause you know, we announced it and, um, we suddenly sold out. Like as soon as we announced that you guys were coming, we sold out because I guess people feel like if anybody's going to be kidnapped, it'll be Max and Stacy. It won't be us. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? And so I Googled it. And it was like El Salvador. And it was just like, I hadn't even highest, thought. Highest highest yeah. murder rate in the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, I just, uh, I mean, all I knew about El Salvador at that point was President Bukele. So um, because he was a Bitcoiner, right? So I didn't even think to uh, Google it or anything. And so I Googled it and I was like, oh my God, they've already <laughs> sold all these tickets. And oh my God, we have to go to this place. We're going to be kidnapped and murdered <laughs> and all this stuff. And when we were in Miami on the flight taking off and uh, I text messaged my uncle and um, I said, I just wanted like him to know. <laughs> I was like... Uh, I I'm don't about come to, back. I said, uh, I'm about to die. And he goes, why? What's happening? Where are you going? I was like, <laughs> I said, I'm going to El Salvador. And he's like, why? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. It's a Bitcoin conference. And uh, he's like, but why? And I was like, I don't know. But just so you know, like, we're about to die. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then we arrived. And, um, you know, so we've been to many places in Latin America. And one of our favorite countries is Mexico. We've been there many, many times. And so when you come here and you meet Salvadorans, they're like crazy nice. Like yeah. they're like really nice people, like super warm. So it was a bit of a shock because you're like, wait, like, isn't this like MS-13 and homicide capital? Like how, how are these people murderers? Like, it doesn't make any sense because it was, they were so nice. Like, there was nothing rude about them. At least, like, I was expecting, yeah. like, rude, hard people. And not even nice, like, they're trying to sell you something. No. They're just genuinely nice. Yes. So, and, like, like people were, like, when we checked into our hotel, like, people, like, you know, it's so small. Everybody knew where we were immediately. And they were leaving us letters and notes, inviting us to dinner at their house. And I was, like... <laughs> <laughs> like inviting us to meet their mom. And I was like, what the, man? anyway, so people were so nice here. And then of course, like, then you find out a little bit about the history of the gangs that they're actually American, essentially. They were <laughs> shipped from the prisons in California. So then it made sense. Ex exported from the U.S. Uh, yes, yes, our yeah. biggest export here, which is, um, you know, again, you know, there are so many things like it doesn't even take it, that much Googling to figure out, um, you know, the stuff that the the New York Times, New Yorker, Washington Post, Bloomberg, you know, when they use words so carelessly about El Salvador or President Bukele, when they use like the D word dictator or something like that, you're like, which is crazy because you ask them like, okay, back that up. How, in what way is he a dictator? Well, they never, they never can. I mean, he has overwhelming support, even yeah. his biggest detractors will admit that. So it's, it's yeah, but, um, you know, you just do a little bit of a research about the civil war here and who the U S actually, they actually, they would back up. President Bukele, if he were a dictator, yeah. based on their own history, our own history of America in Latin America, they prefer dictators. So, uh, and they call them great guys. So, if they were calling President Bukele a great guy, then you probably know, in fact, he's probably a dictator because that's what they do. That's their history. That's our history of the US State Department, right? It, like, it's not, don't trust verify, go research it yourself. It's not just El Salvador, it's all the other countries of, 
of most of the other countries of Latin America. We support dictators. That's who we support. So, um, including here in El Salvador, and to, de so, to devastating effects. I mean, to it's devastating effects. So, I mean, President Bukele was born during the Civil War. So it's not like ancient history. Yeah. It's not something like the U.S. Civil War, where the last of those, the descendants of those people have died already. Like, this is like recent history of what we've done and the massacres and the and the all the horrible crimes that happened during that time. And then the gang war, like all of that was all of those things where you all the crisis on the ground here that President Bukele inherited. And then, you know, it never got fixed, right? Because because there were only mediocrities and small men and women who plundered the nation. I mean, literally plundered. I mean, left with trash bags full mm. of cash. Yes. And so here's a guy who is like, has a vision, is a leader, is not corrupt, and has enlightened thinking, and is a leader in the vein of somebody like Lorenzo the Magnificent, the Lorenzo de' Medici, who, you know, okay, Medici was a rich guy, but what do they know him for? They, like his legacy is not that he was a rich yeah. guy in his life, right? His legacy is what, we all know today as renaissance and the the ideas and the and the culture and the art that transformed human history like that's the sort of legacy that president Bukele will have and you know so i get i get really upset when uh, you know the us media is so wrong about it it's not even like a little bit wrong it's just like the exact opposite of actually what is here well, and just talk to the people here. I mean, the people support even things that I'm like, I, I don't know, maybe they're pushing that too far. But you talk to local people, they're like, no, this is what needs to happen. Like, we've been deluged. We've been at war for the last two decades. We need to put an end to this. And, and yes, there will be some collateral damage along the way. But if we don't stop it now, we're going to have so many more lives destroyed, so many people dying, so many like people feel that their only way is to to go to the U.S. And it's, I mean, for me, mm. it's heartbreaking because you would see this kind of over and over again. People felt like I can't open a business here because I'll be extorted and I might be killed. So they were not being productive. They were not unleashing their potential. And most of them were winding up in the U.S. working in dead end jobs. Yes. So I'm putting been, my, uh, my hat here. <laughs> well, they're all coming back. The diaspora are returning. So um you know, I'm sure they reach out to you. They reach out to me too all the yeah. time. And then they're like, yeah, I never thought I'd want to come back to El Salvador. But now, like, that's my goal is to get back to El Salvador. Well, so. we, we, we met this guy, uh, Martin. He runs a craft ice services company. So he makes craft ice cubes for like cocktail bars. And um, he's Salvadoran. He left in the 90s as a you know, like eight year old child. He was like La Union, Bitcoin city area yeah. um, because of the gangs. So his best friends were killed by gangs. Like since he left, uh, his family moved to Houston, but he uh, has moved back just completely here. And uh, because of Max and Stacey, and, well, I mean, obviously because of President Bukele, because President Bukele put El Salvador in the news. And so he's Salvadoran and Houston. And he keeps seeing El Salvador talked about. It. He's like, what the heck? Like, I'm Salvadoran. Why are they talking about El Salvador? And so he was like looking at the news and he kept seeing Max and Stacy in there. He's like, what are these two gringos doing these there? Crazy like, white people are there <laughs> and I'm I'm stuck in the US. Yeah. He's like, I'm not, hey, I'm going there because if they're there, then I should be there. So he met, he he like ran into us. I mean, it's is easy to run into us, right? Like we're in one of three places in San Salvador. So he uh, ran into us at Il Bon Gustayo and he's like, hey, I'm here because of you guys. And uh, you know what? It's not fair that you get to like have all the fun. So I'm here for the fun and the good times. And it's like, all right. So is he doing his craft ice business here in El Salvador? Yes, yes, yes. And he's actually our neighbor. 
Okay. So, um, I mean, it's amazing that that's even a potential business here. A few years ago, there's no way there'd be that type of demand. Yes. But that's the type of things we see coming in and how the economy is growing. And you see, you know what, all through San Benito, where we, you know, walking around, you see the 80s, you see the past di disappearing. Yeah. People are ready for today and tomorrow because of President Bukele, because you see what what you see in a, a lot of parts of San Salvador are the remnants of the 80s of what all those like heavy gated uh, windows, um, like dark. Everybody, nobody wanted to sit out on the on the sidewalk and the on tables and drinking their B coffee. Businesses wouldn't even put signs out front. You had to like yeah. know where they were because they would get extorted if they had signs out front. So they would like. It's like, how do you even find these businesses? You're like, oh, you have to know. Yeah. And you have to tell the guard and he has to let you in. And it's. So now you, you know, you walk around and it's all like everybody's opening up, right? They're opening up their cafes to the you know sidewalk and the sun and and the everybody walking around, people watching. So it's you, you see it every single day, like the entirety of, of San Benito is transforming before our eyes, like in the year we've been here the number of restaurants that have like physically changed to as a kind of manifestation of the cultural change and the the psychological change that president bukele has brought about is i mean it is only him like there's like no other source of credit to be given here like he's the one guy who changed the way people saw themselves here and it's amazing to see. It's amazing to witness with your own eyes how, like, a psychologically abused people, essentially, yeah. for decades. You had an abusive government that was just plundering from them. They had abusive gangs that were killing them and, and denying them liberty and, and stealing from them. Uh, you had abusive media. The headlines were just relentlessly negative. Um, homicide, homicide, homicide. Like I said, like, how can, like the headlines had us so afraid of Salvadoran people. And we arrived to the shock of just how nice they were. Not just like nice, like, hi, how you doing? <laughs> you know, that fake, like saccharine nice. Yeah. They're like warm down to the bone. And so think of the abuse that was, that like you're a nice person and the headlines keep on saying, you're a horrible person. You're a murderer and a thug. And you're like, <laughs> and still they stayed so nice this whole time. Like they didn't let the, the, that propaganda against them turn them into the, the headlines that they wrote about them. And you also had a wealthy elite that kind of used the system to their own benefit that I think those are some of Bukele's biggest critics now because he's mm. shaking up this kind of comfortable system that they had. Um, but I think even them are starting to realize, wow, we're going to benefit from this, too, because there's all these new businesses and, and funds flowing into the country that's going to benefit everybody. So I'm starting to see even some of his biggest critics start to mm. come around that this is going to benefit them also. Yeah. But again, like what I was saying about Medici is like if he had just stayed a rich guy. You know, there were other rich guys. There were other bankers. Would, would would we know him? Would like would he have any impact on history other than being a rich guy? But instead, he helped transform actual history, the fabric of space time. Yeah, like that's that's something so profound, and only a few people can do. And President Bukele is doing that. Like he's actually transforming is you know i call it the greatest rebrand in history but it's just like it's transforming physical matter and time space like it is transforming psychology culture uh an economy the economy is small compared to the bigness of the idea and the and the culture and the 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 people and that, that all the intangibles, but even like, um, you know, as he mentioned on Tucker Carlson's show, as the president mentioned on Tucker's show, it's like, um, if you went to Madison Avenue and said, hey, 
okay, I'm the leader of this country. We have six and a half million people here. So we have, we're, we're known as the murder capital <laughs> of the world. And, and the place um, everybody are fleeing. Yes. The, uh, we have three million, close to three million, two and a half million Salvadorans in, in America because it's too fucking scary here. Um, how much would it cost you to rebrand us? Like, what would they even come up with? Like, it, it would cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And then nobody would buy it, right? Nobody would, like, because it's going to be, hi, come to, like I said, like, it's going to be saccharine. This is going to yeah. be, like, um, you know, planted headlines. And instead, what he did was, you know, he was already a leader, but I, I think Bitcoin helped him, helped reveal him to the world. Like, in order for a tiny country like El Salvador with a big problem of being the homicide capital of the world, in order to transform on the, on the scale down to the foundation that he has, you know, Bitcoin enabled that because he could say all he wanted, but if they didn't listen to him, what good would that have done, right? But Bitcoin forced them to talk about him. And that was the extraordinary thing about it. He was already a leader. It yeah. didn't, like Bitcoin didn't make him a leader, but it made his message heard. And that- it gave him the world stage. It gave him the world stage and he shined, right? He didn't, um, he didn't mess it up. He just shined. And the results are here. Like you see it every day here in Bitcoin Beach. You see the people coming, you see the transformation. You know Chimbetto very well and you know his story. His story helped, you know, me in terms of when we were first here, understanding that power that I'm talking about that President Bukele has, which is when he was telling me the story of how he grew up and it was one of like a, a, a story of really despair because you're, you have to get used to losing all the time. You were always losing. You were losing your family and friends to fear and all the bad headlines and the bad reality. They were going to America. They were always leaving here. So that psychology of like, you live in the shit place, we're going somewhere better. And that somewhere better is not here. It's not within you. It's not within your community. It's not within your country. It's out there. It's not even a place you can legally go to. If you want to go there, you have to risk your life and, and spend $12,000 and do it illegally. Yes. And then he, Chimpeta's story is like, now he has, you can you see his face like light up that like, he has childhood friends who called him up the other day to say he wants to move back. And like that is they went from losing all the time, losing family, losing friends, losing hope. To winning all the time. So El Salvador is always winning. They're winning back their diaspora. Paso a paso, one at a time right now. But it'll be a flood. Like that's how these things happen. Like when the when an e when you transform like that, it's not like, you know, the media likes to like, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. But, you know, you've had this tidal wave of history of despair and losing. And then it stopped. And now it's like changing. And, you know, in that period of like moving back to a, a different direction, a completely different direction. It's been decades of losing, yeah. right? really 200 years of losing. And now I think you, you're going to see 200 years of winning. Because I think also like when you give the people their liberty, as he has, he's restored their rights, their human rights that they are born with, they're endowed with by the make our maker, you know, that it's hard to to get them to lose it again, right? Because they they now have it and they're going to keep it because they know what it's yeah. like not to have those rights. Um, 
So I think, you know, El Salvador keeps winning and it's going to be, um, I say, tell people to get ready for good times. Well, I think people underestimate what an impact psychology has on development. Yeah. It's not the countries with the most resources that develop. It's the ones where there's hope and there's a sense of building something for the future. And that was never here in El Salvador before. But now it's like, wow, all these people from around the world want a Salvadoran passport. And I was born with one. So now they feel like they're the lucky ones. Yeah, I think I just when you when you hear their stories and when you meet Salvadorans who got to feel that transformation to live in a hopeless situation of losing and despair to to being like the winner and and that and then you can go and take a pen and write like a a, a fud headline about those very people you met it's just ridiculous no that's why i get i get so angry and i take it personally because i've seen so many families like destroyed by what was going on here and how much hope there is now yeah. and to see people just oh well not everybody's using bitcoin so it's a failure you're like are you kidding oh, me okay wait so you know what my idea about this adoption thing so again i've been in bitcoin since it was a dollar and there's always been this adoption like if, if, since day one it's been like oh this this coffee shop accepts bitcoin for their coffee you know it's uh, that's not the thing that matters to me now think of like the greatness that i've just mentioned about renaissance how the renaissance transformed you know, Florence into what we know it of today. The first came the Florin, which was the most perfect money of its time. The perfect weight and measurement for gold. A fair money. Yes. It was fair for everybody. It was trusted. And it wasn't about, you know, adoption by the local pizzeria to like, let's get them to adopt the Florin where it was important was that the merchants in North Africa wanted the florin because everybody had their gold coins, yeah. but they knew exactly what the florin was, that it was the perfect weight and measurement. They knew to trust it. So the guy who came to buy some goods from the North African merchant, say some spices or whatever, he would get the better deal because the guy wanted his money. So it was uh, a greater distance of trade and trust between, like you already have trust in your community, right? Like your local community trusts each other. They know each other. Everybody's like, you walk into Bitcoin Beach and within I, five minutes, everybody knows you're here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Every single person has been told it's on the grapevine that you're, you're here. So, but it's at the greater distance, the trade between El Salvador and say China or India or Europe, you know, that it's the, that, that's the, the, the sort of adoption that matters on the nation state levels so that, so that not only does the treasury, the Salvadoran treasury have it now. So they're already like as distrust as the next financial crisis starts to happen. And we all know it well, right? We've already had all the QE and the debasement of our fiat currency grid. This is, you know, chance on brink of second bailout for banks. Well, when the central banks are on brink of second bailout of global financial system, all these other nations, everybody still needs to trade. They're going to know El Salvador has the money we want, right? We'll trade with them because What's the U.S. going to send us? Some dollars? Euros? Like, we don't want those. Uh, okay, we'll take gold, but it's going to take us months to get it here, right? How do we fly it here? How do we insure it? And it, it, how do you insure it, right? Because you have to insure the flight. And the, if the when the fiat's, like, collapsing, like, how yeah, do you... Yeah, the world's you, falling apart. Yeah. How are you going to insure a flight get yeah, somewhere? Yeah. yeah. But Bitcoin... You don't need to uh, worry about transporting it across the seas to China. Uh, it's there. It's instant, and it's um, you know audited its its settlement as as they receive it. So that 
that's going that's the most important adoption and the psychology again you know well i know you'll soon interview max so i'm going to steal his line before he can say it to you <laughs> so this is the advantage of going first you know you don't change bitcoin bitcoin changes you <laughs> As Max Kaiser says. So, I mean, I think we could all see, you know, that it has transformed, it has improved, like helped transform not only El Salvador, but because it helped transform uh, President Bukele as well. Like he's really risen to greatness. Like he was a, a good leader, but I think he's now like, one for the history books, like in 500 years from now, just as you and I are sitting here talking about Lorenzo the Magnificent, somebody in 500 years will be having a podcast, maybe in this exact studio, and they'll be talking about Najib Bukele. I don't know what his nickname will be, but he'll have a nickname. Yeah, he'll be the one who transformed the world's, not just the country's, but the world's financial system. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, I, I don't even, you know, I know it's there. I've already seen the headlines. I, I've seen the history books in 500 years from now. So I already know he's there. So it's a good thing. I think he know. knows he's there too, so. <laughs> well, that's important. Yeah. Because it, I think it's. Um, I think he wants to go down in history as a world changer. Like that's his. That's what he feels he was born for, and that's what what drives him. And, and well, it's a, it's El a Salvador good, is benefiting from that. It's a good uh, natural motivating feeling, right? Yeah. To like, if if you want to be there, you've got to be good. You, in fact, you you can't just be good; you've got to be great. And so, it's like competition is good. It creates, you know. Th better goods and services, but that same competition in your, in your psychology, your mind to drive you to be like, when you're at the top, you know, when you're the leader, how do you, ha how do you have that same sort of, um, you know, challenge to keep yourself, to make yourself great. And it has to come from within, right? It has to come from those sort of ideals that you know he he kind of makes me feel old-fashioned like you know up until i moved to el salvador and, and i met him you know that you know those corny things like courage and valor and uh honor like having like these sort of principles um you know that's something i feel now that i never really felt before because i you know we lived in a fiat trashy world and those aren't valued clearly like the the disaster that you you just walk across the um you know the the, uh, the the top of that pyramid right is america and you could see it's saturated with fraud from top to bottom and just plunder in a very like decadent way like the, the el salvador had plunder at, at the bottom like it was a it was already at the bottom and it was like picking nickels up, right? This is just like extraordinarily gross and decadent of, of, of some end of Roman empire sort of yeah. way that you just like, and, and you think of like the uh, center of it, you know, Wall Street for finance, but the culture is in Hollywood and in San Francisco and the extraordinary human suffering and it's so gross and decadent. It really is decadent. Like that absurd. You would have somebody who told you 10 years ago that we'd be at this, but you're like, no way. You're a conspiracy theorist. But it's like even worse than you could have ever imagined. It's so bizarre. It's so surreal. And so all those words you think of like at the end of a, of a previous epoch. Like so when Orwell was writing about totalitarianism, what you observe, like that the these sort of like the fact that we what we know now about social media and the social the tech giants out of Silicon Valley, how they're the ones being uh, enforcing uh, groupthink and 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 censoring and and 
controlling conversations. And then you go, if, if you, it's hard to believe because you read about it, but then until you go see what San Francisco is, you can't believe that so much human misery and human excrement could just be piled all over those streets and, and needles and, and, and humans, like people that are human, but lying on the street like a dog, you know, you just can't believe it's true, but this is how they run their own community. And they are supposed to be in charge of telling everybody in El Zante how to live. Like you're like, oh my God, look in your backyard. Yeah. Like, why are you telling El Salvador what to do? Like you need to sort yourself out. So they're the ones controlling the global conversation at the moment. And I think Bitcoin is was a reaction to the decadent financial system, but I think it's also spawned, you know, there are a lot of this, uh, you know, Bitcoin is censorship resistant money, but I think that like we were talking about the psychology and the mindset is like, it's, it's, it's changing the individuals who find Bitcoin or it b become Bitcoiners and it changes the community and it changes everything. So you're starting to see like Nostra, you know, the, the decentralized apps, you're seeing whole punch and keat, you're seeing like, you're, you're seeing like what the future that Bitcoiners are building. We're building it here. El Salvador is Bitcoin country, but it's attracting those same people. It's no wonder to me, like it makes perfect sense that somebody like Paolo Arduino, who, who, who created, who built the technology of whole punch and keat and all these peer to peer peer to peer technologies that will be built upon whole punch um that they're here like this is the this is it you see already that renaissance 2.0 building because it makes perfect sense like it the the positive feedback loop that starts to happen is what led to florence right greatness begets more greatness excellence begets more excellence like how that that the reason why I always like was so fascinated by Renaissance, the same thing with uh, ancient Greece and like how, how did like Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, how did these guys come together at the same time? Like, like not just one great yeah, guy, there's yeah. like three or like all of like Florence, like how, how did all these people get in one place at one time in this like brief period of this entirety of human history? How did all these thinkers get into like scotland and and paris like at the same time like to come up with these enlightenment ideas like how does that greatness happen but you see that with bitcoiners as well like great like it's that reinforcement there's, and there's also, a natural attraction they they come together and seek out those they come are, together but they challenge each other yeah. to excellence you yeah. have to like you're if you if you can't be a shit coin you can't be weak you can't have like just like you can't you you can't lack courage, right? And go on Bitcoin Twitter. Like they will like <laughs> annihilate you and tear you apart for uh, any sign of, you know, in that Aristotelian way of, yeah. of courage. Yeah. Not just like you you have to be brave, you have to be bold, you have to have valor, you have to have integrity, you have to have honesty, you have to have principles, you have to have all these things. And they won't relent. They won't just let you be lazy for one freaking day. Like they are just on there nonstop nagging yeah. you. <laughs> so uh, I think that's, that's why you're going to see like El Salvador is naturally going to become the, the Florence 2.0, but also Singapore 2.0 and Hong Kong 2.0. So, so how long do you think realistically, like how, how long do you think it'll be to, till the mainstream narrative is that El Salvador has become the center of the world. Do you think that that's five years, 10 years? When, when do you think, uh, how much time do you think people have to get here before the, uh, the masses start moving here? Well, I mean, I wonder like, did, um, how did they talk about Florence at the time? Like, okay, you know, you're hanging out with Michelangelo, Leonardo and Botticelli. Like, are they all like, hey, we're so we're like the center of the art universe, right? We're making history. Do they know? Like, did, are they talking about themselves like that, or is it something that history will talk about? Yeah, it's 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 hard to know, right? But I know that you know my personal feeling about how I like to you know build like quietly, like right? Cypherpunks write code is the ethos of Bitcoin. 
obviously I don't write code, but the, the, the thing is like, you just keep building, building. and just doing like, uh, not talking about how great you're going to be. Like I talk all the time about how great El Salvador is and how president Bukele is, but he doesn't talk about how great he is. Right. But if he did, then you would be concerned because, uh, well, maybe he's like not busy building. Yeah. So he's busy building. And I'm busy, busy yeah. building, not not worrying about price, not <laughs> yes. having any second thoughts. Never. Doubling down. No doubts. I mean, I'm always like, oh, no. he's getting beat up so much on the price, but he'll come back out and just like, nope, we're buying more. Well, we're, he has courage. Yeah. Yeah. He's 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 got principles yeah. and, uh, you know, a moral compass. That's I was. um like studying that, like talk, like how how is he a leader? Like in what way is he a leader or a statesman or like the the greatness? And I was, um, you know, this notion that there's four concepts that you have to have is like you have to have a vision to be a leader, right? Because if you don't have a vision, <laughs> like you have to lead people to somewhere, right? Yeah. Like so, you have to have a vision of where you want to be, like. Where El Salvador is going is the place we want to be. Never tell, let them tell you that you're too small to be big. Like yeah, El Salvador is going to be Singapore. El Salvador is going to be Florence. Like you, you have a vision that you can be this big. And yeah, you know, he, he says that. He said that when they were the murder capital of the world. <laughs> and you're like, okay, buddy. Like, okay. <laughs> right? Okay. Let's, let's see. Yeah. So he has a vision. But if you have that vision and you can't deliver, then you're just a guy who said that you guys could be great when you're the murder capital of the world, right? So you have to have principles, a moral compass, and most importantly, I think, is the ability to persuade people to believe in your vision. And that's what he has, right? Because if you have a vision and you can't persuade people to come along for the journey, then it's you with a vision and nobody there. It's that, yeah. that, that famous video, right, of the, the first mover, the guy who gets up yeah, and dances yeah, crazy. Yeah. And the most important is the first follower, right? The, the, the first person to like, okay, I'll get up and dance with that nut job. And then, well, two doesn't look like a nut job. You look like you guys are starting a movement. Yeah. And then everybody gets up, right? Well, that's what like President Bukele is a leader the first mover and like we're we're the first followers like we're we're here believing in his vision and everybody will return there's two and a half million salvadorans in america okay maybe some can't return because they have now family situation there or kids and schools and stuff like that but a lot of them will come back yeah say half of them will come back um and we're going to need a bigger country <laughs> to fit all the people who are going to move here. No, there is, uh, there's going to be lots of people regretting that they didn't uh, move here earlier because it is, it's, it's going to be the most desirable place in the world to be. And so it's, there's going to be a lot of competition for, for, for space, for real estate, for, and I mean, I think they'll accommodate it and I think it'll actually enrich all the people. I'm not fearful that it'll be overpopulated or anything like that, but I think people will regret not having moved here earlier. Well, you know, people regret not getting into Bitcoin when we told them about it in 2011. It's not, it's not easy. Like, yeah. it, 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 it's like I said, like those old fashioned concepts of courage and valor and bravery and, and those sort of notions are, are foreign to us as a society. But also um, there is a lot of peer pressure and probably even more so now because like what we're saying, Silicon Valley deplatforms you and shadow bans you and and silences you for daring to like go against their narrative. So if their narrative is that this is this is still a bad place, uh, President Bukele bad, El Salvador bad, Bitcoin bad. You know, it takes the, there's only a certain sort of person. I mean, you always have that 80-20 rule as yeah. well. Like there, like only certain people have the courage to do it. And then they'll all show up, you know, five years, you know, 10 years from now. 
Like, oh, we're early. <laughs> well, they'll, they'll be saying you get El Salvador at the price you deserve. Yes, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, I feel, well, I feel like um, for me personally, what I, how I observe where we are in the world in time and evolution of this revolution of monetary history is that we were in the age of Bitcoin since 2009, January 3rd, 2009, began the age of Bitcoin. Now we're in the age of Bukele. So we, we you know, I mean, not the, the other age doesn't end. It's just like they're moving together and he, President Bukele is on riding on top of that. So what I mean is like with the, the florin was perfect money, but the florin is just money, right? It doesn't build Florence. It doesn't attract Michelangelo and Leonardo. It doesn't attract the, the discoverers the age of discovery was there in Florence and the Renaissance. It doesn't attract the best and brightest, right? It's, it's a leader who has the perfect money and the perfect money helps that leader attract the best yeah. and brightest. And the thing about Bitcoin that is even better than the florin or gold is that it's also like a mindset. It's also like, um, it's, it's like something more spiritual. It's more uh, profound. Yeah. You wouldn't just get excited just about money like you do about Bitcoin because it, it represents something that's really hard to quantify or put in yes. words. And that's why really... there's so many metaphors yeah. about Bitcoin <laughs> because it is like, well, they say that about like God, like God is everywhere. God is everything, right? It's, it's, it, and God manifests in many ways, in mysterious ways to many people in many different ways. And the same thing with Bitcoin, like gold is gold. Gold is a, you know, it does have some magical properties and, uh, you know, it was, it still is layer one money, you know, it is good money but it's not perfect money. Yeah. It's not great money. Like Bitcoin is Bitcoin's great money. And we now have a great leader, which is president Bukele, who is president Bukele. Um, but yeah, so it comes with, it comes with something magical that never existed before, which is like this global uh, nation, right? It's like, for, it's been quite a few years that I feel primarily like a Bitcoiner, right? Like that's my nationality. When I go to Argentina or you were just in Africa or, you know, Asia or Europe, like, and you, like, if you're at a Bitcoin conference, it doesn't like every, people are from all over the world, right? But yeah. you immediately, you feel a connection like you used to feel based on like what town you grew up in. Like, oh, you're from Boston. Okay, I'm from Boston too, what part? Like. You know, you have a connection that is so immediate in you because you understand exactly who they are. And that's interesting because you know exactly what sort of person they are and what sort of principles and moral compass they have, right? Because they're a Bitcoiner. And you know, there's so much you know about the person yeah. based on, on just that. And that's pretty interesting because if, if you're a gold holder, you don't necessarily know, it doesn't tell you any really thing maybe that they're old crotchety men <laughs> who knows but <laughs> but uh you know there's there's no there's no, there 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 are no metaphors for gold right and bitcoin there aren't enough metaphors for it <laughs> like no metaphor on its own could possibly explain what bitcoin is yeah and that's a, the the amazing thing about it is like that's why there's so many podcasts too <laughs> <laughs> like there can't be enough podcasts because there's so much to say about Bitcoin because it's impossible to look at it and see it because it's like one of those uh, 
what are those protons that like as soon as it's like quantum in nature like as soon as you look at it it changes yeah. like you can't like what where did it go wait bitcoin was that and every that's the thing it's like because it's a network right and it's a community you wherever you are in your own individual journey is how you observe bitcoin but the community is also moving at its own speed as a group but you on your own journey, you might think of it like, oh, I need to make sure every pupuseria accepts it and adopts it. And that's what I want to do. That's my mission there. Or I want to, you know, speculate on this. I hope number goes up, um, you know, or and at, so, at some point you usually either go crazy and become a shit coiner <laughs> and feel like, you know, that it has endowed you with some sort of godly immense power or you become very humble and start stacking sats and just become back to a pleb figure out how, yeah how you can give back i mean that's yes. for me seeing circular economies spring up and people actually circulating using bitcoin in day-to-day -day life living on a bitcoin standard and seeing that move from el salvador out to africa to south yeah. america to asia i mean for for me that that brings me so much joy to see like this and the fact that it's coming out of El Salvador uh, is so exciting because well, you guys were are part of this whole story. You're embedded in the history of money and the history, that history book I read 500 years from now, you know, you're part of that history. Like, just like when you go and read about Renaissance Florence, there's like a whole bunch of people. Um, obviously there's a few that are quite exceptional. I was arguing to Max, I think it was yesterday that I was I was better than Michelangelo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, he, he told I'll me second not to, that. He told me not to tell anybody <laughs> that or today, like that I, uh, my doodles were better than his. Well, I've seen, um, you know, from watching you guys here and, and all the work that you're doing behind the scenes um, and just very thankful because I know you've helped push all these things forward. But I can also sense that it's energized you. Yeah. And given back to you that you feel energized by it. And so, which is great. If that's how you want those things to happen, it can't oh. just be a drain on you. It has no. to be something that that's, you know, well, filling you up with, with yeah. purpose. It th Yeah, that's the first time in my life I've ever had that, like a higher purpose that I've always had great jobs, good jobs, like money, you know, uh, fame all that stuff but like there's it's it's hard to describe until it happens to you i know you've done like more work in the community of like helping communities around the world so maybe you've seen this more but it's like an epiphany sort of moment like you it is like a like a transformation that is really deep and profound and i mean it's it's just weird to read like the the stories that I talked about in the beginning where like a Bloomberg article can talk about you and it's so just ordinary, right? And it's just, it's like looking through a parallel universe, like looking at them in this other space of a fiat dark ages. Yeah. Like you're looking, like when the Renaissance emerged out of the dark ages and some people wanted to stay in the dark ages and, and be that dark age person. And here you're having the Renaissance and you're like, what? Well, you know, you're totally look, missing like, it. What are you doing? You're missing all yeah. this amazing art. Go look at David, go look at the Mona Lisa. Like, what are you talking about? And they're like, no, we're, we're going to be in the dark ages. And so there, it, there's just, it's hard to describe your own individual you know, transformation and just, yeah, a purpose. And yeah. it, it feels, um, it definitely feels, this is the first time I've ever felt like total fate and destiny. Like this was, I was definitely meant to be here. I was the, we, you know, Max and I, but like me personally, like my, I was meant to be here because there was nobody better or more, right at the moment and it's a number of things like my experience my own history my own place in bitcoin my my age like it's not like somebody in their 20s or 30s 
or even 40s would have been, you know, right for, for what they, they wouldn't be like in the right place in life. Yeah. Or it would have been weird, like for. Or then have the experience and the contacts and all the different things that, yeah. that you have. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just the right, I was the right person at the right place at the right time. And that's usually destiny, right? Like it's, it's not like an accident. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we will have you back on here uh, really quickly because there's, I think, going to be a lot of announcements and things being rolled oh, out. Oh, yeah. So we oh, will yeah. want to, to hear your insights. And uh, but, but just to leave us today, is there anything you would tell people that are thinking about El Salvador as where they want to make their new home? Um, well, for the Bitcoin office, you know what? Follow us on Twitter, Bitcoin office SV, which is the country code for El Salvador, uh -huh. which was amazing, right? Because El Salvador was always Satoshi's vision. <laughs> the real Satoshi's vision. Yeah, it is. It is the savior. It is. It was in the name. Like uh, people in 500 years are going to be laughing at us at these fiat dark ages people who were sitting there mocking el salvador and mocking president bukele and they're like didn't those people even know is in the name i mean they're called the savior like they came to save humanity from a horrible fiat dark ages like worse than any epoch in human history that humans had created it was like you know it it, it literally is the savior because i think where we are going is the place we want to be here in El Salvador, but where they are going in that fiat dark ages, you see the CBDCs, you see the absolute social control yeah. and the social media and social credit scores. You see exactly where it's going. And it is the thing of dystopian nightmares. Like they, they warned us. Darkness. They warned us. Darkness. Like yeah. the, the, the brilliant writers of, of the previous totalitarian age warned us in their writings. They wrote brilliant books about what, what the signs of what would come. They, they wrote it down like in the forties and fifties and sixties, what we were going to do. And we, we, we like took it as some sort of manual, like, let's do that. <sighs> So I know you guys have your podcast, um, Orange Pill Podcast, and we are we have a new studio right in uh, San Benito, and it's kind of like a setup like this because you know what you there aren't enough Bitcoin <laughs> podcasts because Bitcoin is everything, and yeah, I mean we're you know Max and I have always talked more about more than just Bitcoin like Kai's report we were always markets finance scandal we've always talked about. Um, you know, central banks, financial crimes, financial fraud, the fiat dark ages, yeah. essentially. Um, so we, we, we do take a lot of, we talk about economics and markets and finance and monetary policy and things like that. But, you know, it's kind of like the past, right? That's a negative. There's no hope for it. It's yeah. not like, there, there was a time when we were like reporting and you think like reporting it would change it, but it's like, it's like in crash mode, right? There's no way to, at a certain point when a plane's going down, you can't stop it. There's like, doesn't matter how great of a pilot you are, you can't, it's just going to hit the ground. So that's what it is for that. But we have El Salvador, right? And there's just so much good stuff happening. So there's so much to report here, right? No, hundred percent. I mean, it's it's. I, I can't imagine wanting to be anywhere else in the world. I, I mean, most places people just view like, oh, it's just going to keep getting worse. But there's so much excitement here about the future, and and so many people with excitement and vision that are moving to El Salvador. So if you want to surround yourself with like-minded people, this is the place to be. But you've lived here for a long time, so. You've seen this transformation. I, I, I have seen that transformation. El Salvador wasn't always like that. It, in fact, up to a few years ago, it was a very, I mean, there was, the people have always been wonderful. The, the beaches have always been beautiful, but it had a darkness about it and, you know, a real sadness. Yeah. And I wouldn't have said it was a paradise where now you see it being transformed into a place of hope and, and vision for the future. So, 
Well, you know, you have your place in history now, and um, it's good that we're going to be Bitcoin podcasting together. <laughs> <laughs> we're like the Machiavelli yes, characters, yes. right? You know, somebody needed to report it all, write it all down. But none of us write anymore. We just uh, talk about our metaphors <laughs> on, on the podcast. Well, I feel uh, lucky to be on this uh, journey with you guys. It's been fun getting to know you since you, you've been here. And you never know with when people are personalities, like what's behind it, but being able to see kind of behind the scenes and just how much you guys care deeply about these things and are willing to put the work in. Yeah. And even when you're criticized in the press or have these stupid hit pieces, you know, come out, we see the work that's being done behind the scenes and how it's it's really helping bring this transformation apart. So so thank you for for that. Thank you for serving in in the Bitcoin office there. I yeah. know it's you're not definitely not doing it for the money. It's a uh, <laughs> uh, labor of love. And so, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think 2023 is going to be the year that the proof of working in 2022 happens. Like you're going to see the proof that we worked in 2022. Yeah. So I think you're right. We have a lot of good news coming very soon. The first six months of this year are going to blow minds. This is going to be more than just a chapter in the history book in 500 years the next six months is like three or four chapters all right well we'll have to make this uh, a regular thing then so you can keep us apprised of of everything that that's happening you're gonna have to do that one of those tweet reminders remind me 500 years <laughs> to look and see if this was like actually four par four chapters awesome well thank you stacy appreciate your time and uh your friendship and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll revisit this here uh, in the next month or so. Okay, cool. Thanks, Mike.